Now he goes to the third illustration in verses 40 and 41, and he shows that from the planetary cosmos there is something else about, um, about the resurrection body. He says there are celestial, literally heavenly bodies, and there are bodies terrestrial, literally earthly. Now he's not talking about uh, spirit beings and uh, physical beings here. Verse 40 is described by verse 41. The two verses go together, and what he's talking about is planetary bodies compared to the Earth. All right? There are different kinds of planets in, in our universe, and they're not all the same, are they? They are different. I mean, all you got to do is to go out and look like, like you could see last night very clearly, then you can see that there are a million stars out there and every one of them is different, a different mass, a different brightness, a different distance, you see, different composition, they're all different. And science today, the observations that scientists, scientists are making prove this reality that they're, none of them are identical. They're all different. And they were made that way by God on the fourth day of creation. Genesis chapter 1, verses 13 and 14 tell us that God made the sun to be the brightest light in the sky and the moon to be the secondary light and the stars also. And Paul's point here in these verses is that they're all different. God has the sovereign right to make our resurrection bodies different from our present bodies because he's the same person today that he was then. He's still sovereign. He's still all-powerful. He still himself is above the natural laws. He's the lawmaker. He's the lawgiver. He's the one that has set things in order. And if he wants to change it, Paul is implying, he can very well do what he pleases. So what's so strange about believing in resurrection? If you believe in the existence of God and of the human race, why not believe in the existence of resurrection? That we live under the same factors today that man lived under in the beginning, or the, 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 that's all that needs to be said, right? Same God, same situation. The emphasis in verse uh, 41 is on glory, and many times we use this word without really understanding. Glory be to God! What does that mean? Well, that doesn't mean the same thing as the word glory in this verse. Glory simply refers to the appearance. Uh, to the brightness, to the splendor of something. And Paul says, you go outside and you look at the stars and they're all different brightnesses. Right? They're not the same. Right? They all have different glory. They, they appear differently. Our resurrection bodies are going to appear very differently than from our human bodies. And all you've got to do is look at the example of Christ to see this. In his resurrected body, which, with which he lived 40 days on the world after he was crucified, Christ looked like Christ, he looked like Jesus, he was Jesus, the person hasn't changed, but the manifestation, the possession of the Spirit had changed. He remained, he was a spirit after just as much as he was spirit before, just as much as he was spirit in heaven, but his appearance changed. When he left heaven, he came to earth and became a real human being with a real physical flesh and blood human body. At the resurrection, that flesh and blood body was changed into another kind of body. It's called a spiritual body, and it wasn't anything like his other body. It was vastly different. There were some similarities. It was observable, right? It could do everything that a human body could do, but vastly more. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. I'm getting at the next week's stuff, right? But this is what Paul is implying by showing these, us these illustrations. So wrapping this up, Paul makes the application in verse 42 and 43 and 44. <laughs> uh, he says, basically, just like this, so also is the resurrection of the dead. Right? And he makes a reference to it in these verses. The it is referring to our resurrection body. Okay, so he's going to draw a, a final parallel between natural bodies and resurrection bodies. And he says... On the one hand, it's like a seed that goes in the ground. It's sown corrupt, that is, decaying, 
It is so dishonorable, that is, disgraceful. Number three, it is so weak, fallible, frail, sick, subject to, to uh, problems. And fourth, it is so a natural body. That is, it has to do with the, phys to the human soul. Now, we could really get into some heavy theology here this morning, but the Bible teaches that we, our, our, ourselves, are made up of three basic parts. The part you see is your body, and the part you don't see, or that, get, that makes the part that you do see live, is two parts, soul and spirit. The spirit is the real I, the real me, and my soul is the operation my thinking, my feeling, my conscience, right? my desires, you see, that's the soul, right? Well, all of us are souls, see? and our bodies, our present bodies are adapted to souls. I mean, we, God gave us sexual organs to have our sexual drive uh, to be satisfied. I mean, if he gave us a sex drive and didn't give us some way to use that or to have it fulfilled, it would be ridiculous. And so we have present bodies with that relationship. In heaven, we are going to have that. It's going to be different. We're not going to have a sex drive in heaven. And therefore, our resurrection body is going to be different. Jesus said that the angels in heaven neither marry nor are given in marriage. See, and it's probably going to be the same up there. There's no evidence of it anyways. See? So he's just drawing a parallel. The, there's four characteristics of our fleshly, soulish bodies that we have today, and in heaven we're going to have vastly different. He says, right now it's a reality there is a spiritual body with opposite characteristics. Instead of being decomposing and corrupting and decaying, it is the exact opposite. Jesus was incorruptible. Instead of being disgraceful, it is glorious. It shines. It's bright. It's beautiful, instead of, like most of us have a pretty bad self-image today, you know. We don't re we spend all kinds of money and effort to change what we see in the mirror first thing in the morning. You know, it is uh, disgraceful, it is dishonorable, we don't, it isn't beautiful many times. See? All the time, really, to be honest with ourselves, the human body is ugly. See? That's the way God made it. Because the next body he gives us is going to be beautiful. That's a real difference. And then, uh, instead of being weak like we are now, we're going to be powerful. Christ had real interesting powers. You read about it, you know. The ability to pass through solid objects. The ability to eat, but not necessarily the necessity to eat. You see? The ability to overcome gravity. You see? That was the nature of his resurrection body. That's the kind of body we're going to have. You see? And finally... Instead of being merely associated with the natural, fleshly soul, it's going to be adapted to the human spirit. Right? And that's, uh, that's really interesting. Now, having established that, Paul has basically answered the, the second question. What kind of a body are we going to have when we're raised from the dead? It's a body that is related to our present bodies as a stalk of wheat, and the field is related to the seed, the naked grain that was planted. It is related, right? It is something that we're going to get after of the same kind of a process, death and institution of new divine laws. It is a, um, it is a very different body from what we have now, and Paul has shown four contrasts. Now, having stated that, Paul goes on to his... First question, second. Right, he answers his first question, secondly. The first question was, uh, how is it going to take place? What is the method? And now Paul moves from the world of science, the natural world, to the world of human history. Right? Paul is quite a, quite a man. He was an expert in all of these fields. Right? Paul is going to show now that this second thing, this second question of how is this going to take place is answered not by the physical, by looking or illustrating our future experience to the present world in which we live, but he's going to uh, compare our future experience with human power.
past, with human history. And in these verses, Paul draws a contrast between two men, and he's going to show that we are related to these two men. There have been all kinds of figures in human history that have greatly affected the human race. I mean, most of us have heard of Freud, you know, the guy that gave us the psychology that has led to the moral revolution in, in the world in these last days. You know, uh, getting rid of God's morals and supplanting them with humanistic morals. Uh, most of us have heard of Karl Marx, the guy that was instrumental in bringing communism and Mao Zedong, you know, and on goes the names, you know. Thomas Jefferson, one of the guys that, you know, led uh, to the freedom of the United States, right? Sir John A. Macdonald, the guy that was instrumental in bringing Canada into existence as a nation. There have been many great human figures that have greatly affected humanity, but Paul talks about the two greatest, the two greatest, and they're both of them are named Adam. Adam is a good name, John. Uh, really good. Uh, the first Adam was the first man that was created. The second Adam was like the first Adam, only quite different. And Paul draws a contrast between these two men in verses 45 to 47. So it is written, just like there is a natural and a spiritual, Paul goes on now, he says, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a life-giving spirit. However, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And we'll stop there. What he's done in these three verses has shown us two or three contrasts between these two atoms. This is fascinating. This isn't my dreams or the dreams of theologians. This is what the Holy Spirit caused Paul to write. God says, look at human history. There have been two people that have tremendously affected us. We are what we are because of the first man. He was made from the dust of the ground, and because he sinned, every one of his progeny, his descendants, are going to return to the dust of the ground. Like he was with a human soulish body that was susceptible to temptation and sin and death, so are we. We are just like him. Right? But just like the second Adam was a spirit being who came into this world and took on human form and changed, that is what we are going to be. We are going to take his nature and have it for ourselves. That's Paul's reasoning in verse 48. As is the earthy, such are they also that, is, that are earthly. We're going to be just like Adam, dust to dust. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And just like we have continually borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. This is how it's going to take place. You want to know how you're going to be raised from the dead? It's simply speaking because there was a human being born into human history that was vastly different than any other. He was God. And he became man. And by resurrection from the dead, he got a new body that the scriptures declare is going to be the same kind of body that we are going to have. How is resurrection going to take place? It's not just going to be a miracle of God. It's going to be a miracle of God on the basis of a former miracle of God. We've already noticed in the early part of this chapter that Christ is the first fruits, and afterward they that are Christ's. The remainder of this chapter is a full explanation of exactly how that change is going to take place. When and how. Jesus Christ was operated upon by the Father and by the Spirit and he exercised his own power in resurrection. It's going to take the entire trinity to make you a new being. Just like it took the entire trinity to make Christ a new being. And what he is now in heaven, we are going to be. You notice it's future tense here. Verse 49. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now don't let that uh, discourage you. The scriptures declare 
in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, and Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, that, and 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that we who have trusted in Jesus Christ right now are new creatures. Right now, we are very similar to what Jesus Christ was like on the earth. He was God, and he was man, and he was one person. He had both the divine and the human character in one. And so do you and I, if we know Jesus Christ. We're not God, but we have the divine nature within us. And yet we are fully human. And right now we're walking miracles. We're a new creation of God. Now, one of the things that's going to invo be involved in the resurrection is God is going to take a big knife, as it were, and chop off all the human. He's going to chop off the human as we know it. And he's going to let the divine nature instantly have full control over the new spiritual bodies that we have. Right now we have a tremendous battle. The flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh so that you cannot do the things that you would, Paul says in Galatians 5.16. Then we're not going to have this battle. There's going to be perfect unity and harmony. So Paul has asked two questions. What kind of a body are we going to have? And how is this going to take place? We're going to have a body that is related to, but coming after and very different, vastly different from our present bodies. How is this going to take place? It's going to take place when I see Jesus Christ, who's going to raise me from the dead, by a sovereign act of our, my Creator God. That's how it's going to happen. And it's not going to be any weirder than the first day of creation. This is going to be the same circumstances. The Creator is going to institute new laws in the human realm that's going to change the human being. No different than back in Genesis chapter 1, the Creator instituted physical laws, new laws, that had never existed before, to change and bring man into existence. If I believe in God, I believe in the resurrection. You know, we can really take hope. Instead of, like the evolutionists, just looking at the big black hole in the future, there's no hope, you know. It all depends on us, you know. If this world's going to get better, it's going to be because you and I make it better. Instead of that rotten garbage as a philosophy, you and I as Christians have a tremendous hope. Our hope doesn't rest in the fallibility of men. It rests in the omnipotence of our Creator God who is going to reconcile things one day. Aren't you glad? I am. A new day is coming. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that Christians have a tremendous living hope. Help us, Father, to be honest with ourselves and to acknowledge that if you exist, then you are capable of changing things from what we now see. Keep us, Father, from falling into the very present and prevalent attitude of unbelievers and unfortunately many Christians today that they look at this world like the unbelievers. They'll never change. It's always going to be the same. It's up to us to make it different. Father, our hope is in you. Help us to depend by faith on you and allow you to change our lives today. You are in the business of drawing us closer to the image and nature of Jesus Christ, into his very image, so that we can be removed from the image of Adam 